All right, I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, people are still signing on. Uh, welcome to the 12th uh, CRC Roundtable. That's uh, really a wonderful landmark for us. It was a year ago that we started this format of a monthly virtual seminar series. Um, our intention, again, just to remind you, is to host targeted, inclusive, and informed conversations that match scientific advances and management needs. Um, the webinars are designed for contribution, not consumption. Each seminar invites a diverse range of researchers, managers, and other professionals uh, to have conversations around critical topics. And um, they really have a couple of objectives. One is to uh, build the connectivity between all of us, especially around certain issues, and to increase our collective competency for decision making. So as a reflection of that intent, the conversational intent, the panelists have been given about 25 minutes total to make some introductory remarks and um, allowing 30 minutes for discussion. Uh, that's facilitated. I'll facilitate that through the chat. Um, this is all about us and it gives us a place to ask clumsy questions and I think to practice the, the bravery and humility, humility necessary um, for building the future we want. This roundtable follows uh, two webinars during the summer that actually were on a um, intern program. And so we're sort of back to issues of science and management. And at each of these webinars, we've begun by um, answering the question of why this topic at this time and by these speakers. I would say this um, topic has always been an interest of mine. Um, if there are 80,000 industrial chemicals in use in the United States. EPA has only banned nine of them. That leaves 79,991 to worry about. Um, and because we don't regulate those industrial chemicals on the cautionary principle, um, we have to, I think, be cognizant of not being overwhelmed by that number. and. Um, being attentive all the time. I think it's um, difficult when they are things we can't see. And so I think the attention, for example, we can see algal blooms, we can see plastics. That's why those things um, grab our attention and keep it. And I think we quickly sort of um, forget about what's invisible, but is a great uh, risk to uh, both our natural resources and uh, human health. So uh, I think it's a good time. Um, we can't let, I think the TMDL um, suck all the oxygen out of the attentiveness room, so to speak. And we have to keep our eye on these other things. And so I think it's, it's really a perfect time to sort of pick our heads up and, and think about that. Um, Kelly Smalling with USGS has done a lot of the research on this in hydrology and Greg Allen, who's been very engaged with um, the policy and management through EPA and others. Um, we're happy to, to have them join us today. So um, Kelly, I believe you're, you're up first, is that right? Yes, I am going to kick this off. All right. So, um, all right, can you see that? That looks great. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, so in the interest of time, I want to go ahead and get started. Um, this is a big topic, and uh, 12 minutes for each of us is, is not a lot of time to tackle this. So I, before I begin, I really want to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to present today and for all the folks on the phone who are really interested in this topic. And I, I'm actually really excited um, for the discussion following uh, Greg and my talks. Um, so. My focus today is going to give hopefully everyone a, a relatively broad brush overview on contaminants of emerging concern or CECs, focusing on really what they are, why we care about them and why we really should start thinking about them more broadly now and how we study them. Greg's going to get into the nitty gritty detail about the difficulties in managing CECs and as well as how they fit or how they fit or maybe don't fit into uh, nutrient and sediment management actions. 
so for a talk like this, I, I, I like to start by offering up a couple of definitions um, when dealing with such a complex yet vague, I know that's odd, but it's a complex term, but it's also relatively vague, contaminants of emerging concern. What does that mean? Um, as humans continue to alter our natural environment, we really need to find ways to characterize the mixtures of contaminants found in our rivers and our streams. Um, the first definition on the top, I'll, I'll let you all read that, um, but it, it's the definition from Google. Um, but it's pretty robust, and I, I think it does do a pretty good job of broadly define contaminants of emerging concern. But I want what I want to bring your attention to is that it emphasizes the lack of regulation. And I'm going to talk more about this a little later. And, and Denise actually stole some of my thunder and already um, introduced that topic. But we'll get to that more in a couple of slides. The second definition is similar to the first, um, but it's one that some colleagues and, and myself put together for a recent review we did on the grand challenges associated with understanding CECs, um, where we actually needed to kind of limit the types of compounds we discussed, because as you will see from the next slide, there are just so many of them. So the key to this definition really has to do with the difficulties in actually identifying them, prioritizing them, and studying them due to analytical limitations. We just don't have the methods. We don't have the knowledge about what we should be focusing on. And funding. There's so many of these that we actually have targeted methods for that it's so expensive to monitor them that they tend to not be included in broader scale biomonitoring studies because you need a lot of money. Um, examples of CECs, um, I'm gonna throw these out there. This is a pretty inclusive list, but I'm sure I've missed some. Um, we've got pesticides, those that are applied to your lawn as well as um, agricultural fields, pharmaceuticals, uh, human use and veterinary, antibiotic, antibiotics, hormones, natural or synthetic, um, PFAS. These have been in the news recently. I know I'm pretty sure unless you've been under a rock, you've heard about PFAS or the forever chemicals. Uh, plastics, whether it's microplastics, plasticizers. Uh, Denise mentioned algal toxins or biotoxins. And the last one is PCBs. Most of these classes are not really considered new, um, but Sometimes the individual compounds included in these classes can be. For example, with PFAS, PFASs have been used since the 40s, but their widespread ubiquity and occurrence is just actually catching people's attention predominantly because of the potential public health concerns. Pesticides are similar, they've been used forever, but pesticide use constantly changes and we're slowly learning more and more about their effects. So an older pesticide might actually kind of pop back into this emerging class because there's new effects that kind of have caused alarm. And the last one I kind of want to bring to light are PCBs. Greg's going to talk a lot about PCBs, but they're a, an old problem, but now we're seeing new inputs through manufacturing and production. From a source perspective, again, the human built environment and human influence are sources of a lot of these contaminants of emerging concern. And we have a pretty good idea about these types of contaminants, the sources of these contaminants in agricultural areas. However, it gets a little tricky when you start talking about urban and suburban environments because they're so dense. There's so many different types of sources and really identifying which source is leading to which CEC in the environment is, is really hard to tease apart. But on this slide, you can see some photos and a list of uh, some of the major sources um, from wastewater and stormwater to septic systems, um, pest control, again, uh, in suburban and agricultural areas, animal feeding operations, human use, like uh, pharmaceuticals, firefighting, industry, manufacturing, um, et cetera. Uh, one, one other source is natural hormones, 
um, and then estrogens made by plants. So these are contaminants of emerging concern, but they're actually naturally produced and, and not anthropogenic or human sourced. Um, I was asked initially a when we first started discussing this, why or why now? And that's kind of a difficult question. Um, and I guess I would pose why not now? Um, the bottom line is, is that CECs are everywhere. Um, and I think that's why now. Um, we don't tend to think about this a lot. Again, as, as Denise mentioned, we can't see them, um, but we just have to know that they're there. Um, they're in the water that you drink, whether it's from your tap or the bottled water that you buy from the store. Um, they're in the fish that you eat, whether it's farm raised or wild caught, um, the fruit and vegetables that you buy at the store, the clothes that you wear, the furniture that's in your house, um, and then the rain, snow, dust that you're exposed to throughout your lifetime. So the bottom line, we're exposed to CECs in some way, shape or form from the time we're born through death. And that is as, C that's as uh, the National Institute of Health coins that your exposome. That's really understanding that human exposure from birth to death, which is important when you're thinking about CECs. The other piece of this is that regulation is limited. And, and Denise mentioned the 85,000 chemicals that are produced and the small fraction of those that have actually been banned, but also the small fraction of the chemicals that are actually regulated, which is denoted by that little blue dot among that giant uh, orange and red sun. Um, and so, the regulation process also takes a lot of time. So I, I think it's really important for us as, as citizens and, and environmentalists and people that care about our, our environment to, to begin to understand the issue, work with scientists and managers to test some hypo hypotheses and also to begin to use some of those existing management actions and plans to help reduce exposure to these chemicals even before regulation has time to kind of progress and, and take place. And lastly, why the, the, it's a goal within the Chesapeake Bay cr program through the toxic contaminant goal. In the figure over here on the left, the red uh, chemicals that we don't know a lot about, those are all, uh, we're all on that list of CECs that I showed at the beginning we're slowly getting a better idea of concentrations, occurrence and sources, but you know, we're still kind of grappling with the effects and, and how that translates from individuals all the way up to the population and, and what that's doing to fish and wildlife and humans um, in the Bay watershed. So how do we actually take this complex problem and try to break it down and answer some questions about it? Um, we're tackling this issue by taking what we call a one health approach. It's, an, it's not a new approach. It's been adopted by um, the CDC and other public health agencies, but what it does is it really focuses on interdisciplinary and collaborative approaches at multiple scales um, with the goal of protecting health. And this is really important by recognizing the connections between people animals, plants, and their shared environment. In the Chesapeake Bay, we, we did try to take this type of approach and spent about five years in a couple of watersheds trying to really understand stressors, including CECs and those drivers that affect fish and fish health. So that's the issue. Um, what we knew from two decades of work by Vicki Blazer and others is that there were reproductive fish health issues within the Chesapeake and it was hypothesized that chemical mixtures could be playing a role. What we didn't know was the magnitude and extent of that CEC exposure and how potential drivers affected occurrence and concentrations of those contaminants. And for that study, we focused on CECs that are known to induce estrogen like responses in exposed organism because that's what we were interested in, those effects on the reproductive system. So we took this one health or source to receptor approach to begin to understand the factors affecting fish health. 
we needed to understand the sources and we focused on agricultural sources because honestly it was a little easier the important contaminant mixtures and how they change seasonally and whether or not certain landscape drivers influence their occurrence. We also needed a better understanding of effects at different life stages to determine the extent of endocrine disruption in these fish. So for CECs, the primary drivers of exposure included seasonality and stream discharge, as well as a variety of landscape factors like contaminant sources. So understanding these drivers allowed us to predict when exposure risk was at its highest, which allows us to think about life stage sensitivities and potential latent effects. In our study, watersheds with high flow events in the spring and summer resulted in increased concentrations of CECs, indicating spawning and young of the year fish could be at most risk to exposure. But again, these are agricultural watersheds and they have a specific flow dynamic. And when you think about urban watersheds, this risk might be different. So we need to broaden our monitoring to, to span different types of watersheds across the Bay. But results from these studies and other work performed by the USGS, Chesapeake Bay Program and other partners really continues to inform future studies, fill these gaps, hopefully inform management priorities and contribute to a better understanding of the presence, relationships, drivers and effects of these CECs within the watershed. To improve the health of the Bay, we need to continue to prioritize these CECs in our monitoring as well as our management. And reductions we hope will improve habitat quality for fish health and populations well into the future. And with this, I'm gonna hand this over to Greg and he's going to discuss the complexities of managing these CECs. All right, thank you very much, Kelly, and thanks to the CRC team for bringing this topic forward. We need that kind of help, so thank you very much. Uh, and just to clarify, my role here is as chair of the Toxic Contaminant Work Group, which is a work group under the Water Quality Goal Team in the Bay Program. So uh, telling a little bit of the story here, back in 2013 or so, when we were working on the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement, we were able to make the case that that agreement just had to have a set of goals and outcomes related to toxic contaminants. The big goal in ensuring that the bay and its rivers are free of effects is a really big goal. Uh, we probably won't see that in our careers, but it is um, aspirational, and it's something that we want to continue to do meaningful work toward. And I think Kelly made this point, but just to reemphasize that the, the TMDL that gets, by and large, most of the resources in the Bay Program partnership is about three pollutants. It's nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment, uh, and their forms. But uh, if we just uh, added up these categories of pollutants that we tend to put in the emerging contaminant bucket uh, and included all the active ingredient pesticides that are in use, pharmaceuticals, this whole long list, this emerging uh, new issue of PFAS, we would be talking about literally several thousand different pollutants. So our job in the contaminants work group is partly to try to maintain some prioritization uh, with regard to the work that the partnership tries to lend uh, to this topic. Kelly showed you the words for the uh, research outcome uh, for the watershed agreement. There is a second toxic contaminant outcome that is policy and prevention, and that's the one where we try to maintain strategies for reducing high priority pollutants. Right now, that's mostly based on PCBs. I'll give you a little bit more on that. It also mentions mercury. Um, and with regard to mercury, our take has been that it's mostly an air loading uh, issue. The, the source is predominantly air. There are regulations that are coming online or at times are expected to come online. And it's really an air regulatory issue. Our job for mercury is to monitor and hopefully see downward trends over time. 
But for the other pollutant that we mentioned in policy and prevention outcome, PCBs, uh, we're much more active. I wanna show you some panels from a story map that we created. And this was to try to give people a clear view of how extensive this uh, PCB contamination still is. So we have a five panel story map. And on the first panel, which is the next slide, uh, we show the extent of impairments in the watershed that are listed by the jurisdictions for PCBs. So all this coloring you see here is the 303D list impairments that are driven by PCBs. And you can see that the coverage is very extensive. Most of the Western shore rivers, most of the Eastern shore rivers actually as well. The main stem in Virginia, uh, Maryland is making some motions toward listing the main stem in, uh, in Maryland. And you can see that this reaches up into non-tidal reaches of uh, big systems like the James, the Potomac, and the Susquehanna. So the, the extent of impairment for PCBs is very, very widespread. In the next slide, we see the places where there's a TMDL in place for those impairments. And we can see that the Potomac River, Western Shore um, of Maryland, and a few things up there in Maryland at the head of the, um, uh, of the bay are un, under uh, TMDLs that have been written and accepted and put in place. The next slide and next panel is uh, PCB TMDLs that are under development right now. Uh, and that includes a big one, which is the Tidal James in Virginia. Um, also a couple other smaller scales that you see there on the map. So those are in development. And the fourth panel is um, yeah, planned for development. So um, tidal, I'm sorry, non-tidal James, uh, more that I think is in non-tidal Potomac are on the radar for future work. And that leaves us with Panel five, the next slide, which shows in places where there's an impairment, but there's, but there's no uh, TMDL in place, no TMDL that is underway or planned. So these are, these are all the places where we have impairments, but the states have not yet um, said when they're going to get to developing TMDLs for those. So it's a very uh, fluid and, and active area. And for the toxic contaminants work group and our, our strategy behind PCBs, we're really focused on how do we leverage this and make sure that the TMDLs that are in place or that are coming online are as effective as they can possibly be. And for the places where we don't have planned TMDLs, how can we help get there more quickly? What can we do to speed up this TMDL development process and get these areas covered as well? So it, our, our strategy here really relies on the Clean Water Act and the TMDLs. And we're considering ways to lift this issue up to a level that's commensurate with this coverage that you see. The scale of the problem that we show in this story map um, calls for something bigger than what we can do at the toxic contaminant work group level. We don't get the benefit of the cross jurisdiction coordination on this that we get from the watershed wide TMDL for nutrient and sediment. So we're trying to find ways of how we can get uh, the coordination, the sharing of best practices, lessons learned, um, the latest in modeling and technologies for BMPs. How do we get that going? We've talked about it as some form of something like a PCB consortium, where we all come together uh, more formally and for longer periods of time to share on this and hopefully reduce the amount of PCBs that ultimately end up in our fish. A lot of this is driven by the levels of PCBs in fish.
and the resulting fish consumption advisories. Now, Kelly mentioned it's a little difficult to think of PCBs in the emerging contaminant category as opposed to a known contaminant, but um, we, we do learn so much more all the time about this. Uh, um, for example, that there is inadvertent PCB reduction. Whenever the ink and dye manufacturing industry creates certain pigments, including in particular yellow dyes and pigments, there is inadvertent production of PCBs. Um, it appears then in consumer products, unfortunately. Washington State has done some awesome work looking for inadvertent PCBs, and they have detected lower molecular weight and lower chlorination level PCBs in products like uh, sidewalk chalk that children use and um, food wrappers that are using yellow um, uh, dyes and pigments. So it is a dynamic issue, even though it's one we've been working for a long time, we're gonna be working it for a long time to come because PCBs are, are uh, very persistent and they're still coming into the system. So that's a little bit on our, our PCB work. And let's go on now to talk um, uh, more again about these things that we think of as newer issues, contaminants of emerging concern. I'm showing you the cover page of uh, one journal article that's really one of our bellwethers in the watershed because uh, this is Lee Blaney and his team at UMBC that did some monitoring for some of these newer interest contaminants in the Bay watershed in water, sediment, and oyster tissue. So this is a really um, key uh, study for our work group. And on the next page, even though it's real busy, the next slide uh, got some of the, um, the conclusions from this study, and I know this is a lot to look at, but I'll just pick out a few highlights here. It, it basically is saying that uh, when the team went out, they looked at 43 different antibiotics, a few estrogenic hormones, and then some ultraviolet filters. And that's mostly about sunscreen product or active ingredients that are used in the greatest bulk in sunscreen and looking to see, are we seeing these contaminants in uh, different compartments of the Chesapeake Bay system? And the bottom line is, here is there, there were a lot of detects. Um, we have detection of antibiotics in water. We have antibiotics that are associated bo both with human and animal, animal use. So uh, just be aware that when we're talking about pharmaceuticals, we're talking human and veterinary or agricultural use of pharmaceuticals. And that's the whole uh, um, uh, scope of sources on these. And uh, both of those groupings were detected. Um, going down just a little bit more here, estrone, which is one of the estrogens, and four of the UV filters were frequently detected in water sediment and in oyster tissue. And it, again, this is one of just a few studies that we have on oyster and shellfish that helps us to see um, some of these newer concern contaminants, are they in our shellfish? And just, I would say in the last several years, we have a series of studies that will help us draw a conclusion that we do have contaminants in oysters. We, we have um, this estrogen UV filters in this study. We have some studies on uh, microplastics in oysters. And unfortunately, there is some newer data that tells us our oysters that are constantly filtering water um, are also accumulating some of these contaminants. So th again, this really important study uh, helps us understand here that this is one of these ubiquitous uh, sets of contaminants. Um, although the concentrations in, in water and tissue tend to be in the part per trillion uh, 
range. Uh, we do have the analytical methods to allow us to see that. And when there's a bioaccumulation factor, even those part per trillion levels become a risk issue for us. So let's go to the next slide here and I'll try to wrap up in about five minutes so we can have discussion. And this is a table with just a little bit of uh, helping us understand the, the scale and scope of this. And if we just take these pollutants that are in the left column, pharmaceuticals, hormones, PFAS, pesticides, and PCBs, then we start to see just how wide uh, the sources are. With pharmaceuticals, as I mentioned, it is a human uh, issue, human-induced issue, anthropogenic for sure, and it comes out of wastewater. What do we know about some DMPs that um, either currently or if they were enhanced could help us with this? Well, we did a study a little while ago using the GIT funding program and concluded that when we upgrade wastewater treatment plants to enhance nutrient removal, and we increase things like settling times in that treatment process, we drop some of these pollutants um, out of the water, they partition to biosolids, but we end up with less coming out of the effluent for wastewater. So uh, pharmaceuticals, human wastewater, we can do some things there. Pharmaceuticals are important in ag as well. And we do know that um, to reduce the amount of those um, veterinary chemicals that are in manure and then get picked up in stormwater, that manure injection, for example, is a DMP that is helpful. If we get that manure further down into the soil zone, less of it comes off the fields in stormwater. Hormones is kind of a similar uh, picture because they're either coming from human sources, things like uh, 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 birth control pills and treatment that end up showing a signal in our wastewater, or whether they're in agriculture, things like naturally produced hormones that come from certain animals like chickens, for example. Um, those are some of the sources and it's similar uh, BMPs that we know of and envision there. there. There are things we can do in both of these cases to reduce the amount that are loading into our surface waters, both farms and hormones. The next one, per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, PFAS. This is an issue that those of us that are in this industry right now are witnessing explode on the scene. I believe that this will be a topic that will be around for decades to come. It seems like every week we learn about a new use for these, uh, these chemicals. And uh, we're just starting really to go beyond groundwater to look at other uh, compartments of the environment like sediment and fish tissue. And when we look, we tend to find it. Uh, so this is a really dynamic issue that's developing right now. We're excited about a stack workshop that's coming up. Um, Kelly and others will be leading the preparation for this workshop. And it's going to be really fascinating because it's such a dynamic topic. And uh, the Bay Program's kind of kind of put a stake in the ground as far as where do we see these things in the environment beyond groundwater? We know groundwater and drinking water is an issue for these. We want to see where is it showing up in other places. Uh, pesticides, such a big class of contaminants. At least we would say there are hundreds of uh, active ingredients in use in the watershed. Um, it's a stormwater issue in urban areas. Uh, it is a stormwater and potentially groundwater issue because Groundwater can load toxic contaminants to the system. And if we've got a lot of pesticide use in agriculture, there's a chance that both in stormwater and groundwater, we could see loadings of that. Atrazine is 
probably the highest use pesticide in agriculture behind glyphosate. And we see a lot of atrazine in groundwater. Um, um, Greg, I'm gonna ask yeah. if, if you can finish up because you yeah. are beginning to get a lot of questions loaded in the chat box. Yes, I have just this one more thing, which is PCBs. And we've already talked about this a bunch. And you can see PCBs is really a, a stormwater issue primarily. We do get a wastewater signal all the time, but in large part, it's about contaminated lands and stormwater. So there's our, um, sorry, 35 minutes or so of some information on this big topic. And let's go ahead and do some discussion now. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly and Greg. That was really informative. And I'm going to keep my camera off because my connection's a little iffy. Um, I have actually already uh, more than a few questions. The first one is uh, for Kelly. Um, and the question is from, um, it, well, it reads, along one health vein, to complement fish health studies, are there studies being conducted on agricultural producers slash workers? And how do we synthesize these impacts in the most effective way? So I, I think that's speaking maybe to the human health uh, pathway. Yeah, I, 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 it sounds like it is. And um, so yes, there are um, agricultural worker cohorts. Um, they tend to be uh, run by public health agencies like uh, National Institute of Health. Um, the USGS, when we think about public health, we are focused predominantly on exposures and not the health outcomes. Um, we let the public health experts take that on. Um, so we work with public health experts on that exposure scenario, um, but are not conducting the research on those cohort studies long-winded answer, yes, that information is available. There are agricultural cohort studies, um, as well as other cohort studies in agricultural areas with uh, women for breast cancer and things like that. There's a study in California looking at the effects of uh, chemicals on breast cancer occurrence as well. Thanks, Kelly. This uh, next question, I, I think maybe both of you can engage with, but especially Greg, how do you see, and Greg, I know you've been working for a long time tirelessly trying to make sure that, that this issue is, is um, on people's minds. Question is um, from Rachel King, how do you suggest we approach policymakers about addressing these emerging contaminants when science is still trying to collect data to determine their presence and toxicity, how can we encourage such contaminants to be prioritized without strong data? And I think that's a question that probably both of you struggle with. So Greg, do you wanna talk first and then Kelly can hop in? Sure. So Kelly showed a table uh, related to the research outcome that showed red, yellow, green, and it tries to summarize our understanding of uh, occurrence, sources, concentrations, and effects. And the way that we set these outcomes up is once we felt like we had a good understanding of those things for a given pollutant, we could move it uh, possibly to a strategy um, for policy and prevention. So let's start with PCBs and mercury. Let's study these other contaminants that we don't know quite as much about, some of which are certainly new and emerging. And once we get up to that level of knowledge and know that it's a priority risk, we'll start on strategies for reduction. That was the way we set it up. And absolutely, it's so hard. There's just so many things to be concerned about, uh, as Denise mentioned, that it is hard to get attention. I guess to answer the question for those that those that we don't have that full set of knowledge on, it's let's continue to do the research. And that's let's continue to take times when we're looking at the whole breadth of these pollutants that we could be concerned about and making our best call about which ones we should be working on to reduce and which ones we need to continue to study um, current sources, concentrations and effects. Um, so it, it is a constant challenge and we, we try to find venues and ways to bring it in front of people. And that's 
why we ended up with a stack workshop coming up on this new class of PFAS newer. And we just continue that fight of trying to, once we have some good solid science, bring it back to everyone for what can we do to make things better and healthier. Kelly, uh, you might want to talk about how you uh, just sort of manage your your attention and time, right? Because there's 79,991 <laughs> things you could go after, right? So from from your end, how do you prioritize and and at what point do you feel like, you know, you need to give Greg a call and go, hey, I'm, I'm putting this on your radar? Um, well, so prioritizing is always key because as you said there's so many out there and um, unfortunately I think about 80 percent of those we can't analyze <laughs> and we don't actually know if they're in the environment so of the ones that we do have an idea of we we try to do our best to prioritize um, and I think um where you are working on the landscape, whether you're in a predominantly agricultural area in the Midwest, in a mixed use area in California or the Chesapeake Bay, you're going to prioritize things slightly differently. Um, but you know, there's a lot of co contaminants and Greg mentioned atrazine and glyphosate. I mean, we know so much about those. Um, and so I honestly, as a scientist, I don't talk to policymakers. Um, that's not the USGS's uh, ballywick. We do the science and, and hope the policymakers understand that it's needed for them to kind of take a look at some of this. Um, but I think that's the, int that's the great thing about the toxic contaminant work group is it does bring science to managers and, and stakeholders and through kind of information sharing. Um, and I honestly think we need more of that. So if other parts of the country could kind of take what the Chesapeake Bay program is doing and again, getting researchers in, in front of these, the managers and maybe even the policymakers, I, I think maybe we could do some good. Um, the counter to all of this is PFAS. Um, we don't know a lot about PFAS, we're still learning about we we know about the sources but we're still learning about the occurrence the effects um fate and transport but it's a huge issue it has gotten policymakers ear and this is what people are are focused on now so it 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 kind of just depends on the tides and and what's going on in the world on on what these what emerging contaminants kind of make it to the top of the top of the list. And if it affects a human, it's going to make it higher than one that may just affect a fish. And that's my own personal opinion, just based on what we've seen with, with PFAS to date. Is there something to be learned about how PFAS jumped to the head of the line? I mean, how did that happen? Well, I think I can offer a little bit on, on that. For one thing, it's toxicity. Uh, helped to jump to the front of the line. Uh, EPA has proposed drinking water limits for just two uh, PFAS compounds among thousands, working on more criteria, effects criteria. Some of the states have made movements on drinking water criteria, and we're talking about single digit part per trillion concentrations that are showing up for these drinking water limits. And that really speaks to the toxicity of PFAS. It is extremely uh, uh, persistent. So as we turn around now, and Denise, you mentioned the precautionary principle that it's in place other places in the world. And that's really not so much what we do in the US. We tend to put things into commercial use pretty quickly and uh, look later for problems. And so we're turning around now and saying, oh my gosh, this thing that is incredibly persistent and very toxic is showing up at high frequency. Uh, groundwater, we think surface waters as well, starting to look at fish and they're turning up frequently there too. And all of that creates a certain 
urgency and buzz around this that has brought it into the fore and it keep, keeps coming. Thanks. I have a question from Andy Rocchio, and I think it raises a, a bigger issue. And she's asking, have there been recent studies about the cancer rates and or related illnesses in communities around these higher contamination sources? And I, I might add that I think the bigger issue is how connected are our environmental data gathering and our, our public health uh, data gathering. And, and so you know, is that problematic or is, are those two things pretty connected? But her direct question is, is really about cancer rates and related illnesses in communities around the known higher contamination sources. Yeah, well, there's a whole universe of uh, data on PCBs uh, about its effects and uh, its correlation to um, impervious surface, actually. Uh, as soon as a watershed starts to become impervious, you start to see uh, PCBs appear. To, to the question of toxicity and cancer in places where there's more of it, no doubt about it. The, the whole environmental justice movement, I think, was a lot driven by how some of these toxic industrial chemicals uh, tend to be associated with higher industrial areas and places where it's more urbanized and it has, it has been a driver for um, environmental justice from the very beginning, I think, of that topic. And we know that it does appear more so in these developed industrial urbanized areas. And, and there are certain groups of people who tend to be then at risk as a result of that. Um, so yeah, lots of data out there on the effects of these pollutants in areas where there's lots of them. And yeah, that's, that's part of some targeting that we do in the contaminants work group. Uh, we have an infographic on um, fish consumption advisories that are driven by PCBs. We're targeting the rollout in places where it's more urbanized because that's where the higher concentrations of PCBs are in fish. So we try to use some of that thinking to help us strategically as well. And thank and just, you. Oh, can I can I add one thing, Denise? Of course. Um, just to kind of add on to that, I think that you know, um, environmental contamination and cancer clusters. There's definitely been um, work on that around Superfund sites in areas where there's high arsenic and uranium, just from geogenic as a geogenic contaminant. But, but and as well as PCBs and maybe even some agricultural chemicals. But when you th start thinking about some of these other contaminants of emerging concern, the sources are diffuse. So they're, they're characterized as diffuse pollutants. So there's not a one known source. Um, there's a variety of different sources. They're non-point sources. So understanding so, so relating that back to like a specific cancer cluster is always going to be difficult. But one thing that, you know, taking it beyond animals and taking it to humans, one thing that we have been doing is um, working with public health experts, again, in certain cohorts that have some sort of cancer risk or, or some sort of disease risk and really trying to understand what types of CECs are in people's drinking water. So you're making that connection. Um, but particular source to, to human receptor for some of these diffuse, diffuse pollutants can be pretty tough. Thanks, Kelly. That was really helpful. I have uh, two big questions left. Um, one is about um, monitoring. The other is about impacts from climate change. I'll, I'll definitely ask those two. And then at the end, I do want to try and give you each a, a minute for some parting thoughts. So We'll, we'll see if we can get through these next two questions. W one is actually my question, so I get to ask it, which is, you know, how robust are the monitoring programs um, for toxics of emerging concern? And, and how available is that data online? Since the regulatory process is slow, right? How much are we monitoring? And, and does the public have access to that data? So 
monitoring on the national scale is relatively limited. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, there's a lot of funding constraints. Um, if we were to analyze greater than, you know, we have methods probably in house at the USGS for greater than 500 contaminants of emerging concern. Um, and that'll run you $5,000 ish per a sample. Um, so that's a pretty big ticket item for, for a monitoring program to um, really prioritize. Um, so we have been, you know, I think there's a lot of piecemeal monitoring. Like we've done a decent amount of work on, a, you know, a handful of watersheds in the Chesapeake. We have, you know, data from across the country in, in smaller watersheds, but it's not this national monitoring program. Um, so I think one of the things that we have to do is start thinking about priority, prioritizing some of these contaminants and, and winnowing down that list to look at indicator compounds. So if compound X is gonna be there, we're 99% sure compound Y is gonna be there. So if we can kind of start prioritizing and, and really winnowing down that number to actually monitor, then I think that a larger scale monitoring program could be possible. Um, but that, again, that's up to folks that have the resources to do it. So the, the, short, the short answer is yes and no. There are monitoring programs, but they are not national in scope. Um, and yes and no, the data is available. The USGS pro does a really good job as well as the EPA to, to make sure their data is available to the public. Sometimes those databases are hard to navigate, um, but that whatever data is available tends to be online and, and available to the public. Greg, do you have anything to add? Do you want to add to that? Sure. Uh, so there are some lines of monitoring that are longitudinal and we have over time. A few examples are the river input monitoring stations of USGS where they've done some long-term things like looking at pesticides. We have the state's efforts on monitoring fish for their fish consumption advisory programs. Uh, those are a couple examples of a very limited number of long-term data sets we have. Otherwise, it's really uh, piecemeal, I think Kelly said. It's really on a project by project, more snapshot basis that we get data on uh, many of these contaminants in the watershed. It used to be that the Bay Program maintained a database and served a role as a unifying place for all this data, but that was abandoned back in early 2000s. So there really is not one place to go. Um, we have some other sources like the toxics release inventory that EPA maintains where we can get some information about sources and releases. So a few examples of data sources, but otherwise it tends to be study specific. And we don't really have one place as a unifying place to, to serve it to the public. But in, as Kelly said, in most of those instances, there's some place to go. It's not just, it's not one place. Thanks, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just remind people that uh, we do do a wonderful job of, if there are questions that you wanted answered and put in the chat that we don't have time for during discussion, we get those answered for you uh, within a couple of days and, and send out the notes and the link to the recording to everyone. And so, um, you know, uh, please know that we'll do everything we can to get your questions answered. The last one is from Caitlin uh, Gianfrido. This is interesting, and I'll let you sort of answer this one. And maybe if you want to end your comments with kind of uh, uh, your parting thought, um, that'll be helpful. So how will impacts from climate change, like shifting rainfall patterns, increased flood risk, and rising sea level influence CEC transport into the Bay? And what can be done or is being done to mitigate these impacts? So I think Caitlin is assuming there will be an impact <laughs> from those things and, and just your thoughts on what that might mean for managing this issue into the future. Kelly, you wanna? Yeah, I was gonna say, you want me to start? Yeah. And then you can, okay. Um, so that's a big question, Caitlin, and a difficult one to answer. Um, I think that 
the easy answers we don't know yet. Um, but uh, I do think that um, climate change is going to have an effect on contaminant transport. Um, it's also probably going to have an effect on the types of contaminants that you may see um, as temperatures warm, rainfall, precipitation patterns change in agricultural watersheds, your crop type may change uh, depending on what you can and can't grow in areas, which means you may have to um, change your pesticides. Um, you may have to increase your pesticide use because there may be more pests that are associated with, with those crops or fungus as, as the precipitation increases and it becomes wetter. Um, movement into the bay, a lot of these contaminants we know are run, rainfall runoff dominated. Um, so as if precipitation increases, you may see an increasing flux of, of some of these into the bay. They're also associated with sediment. So as runoff increases and flux increases, sediment may increase to the bay. So I think there's a, a lot of um, possibilities and hypotheses that we could we could test as, as climate begins to change um, for, for a lot of these contaminants of emerging concern. Um, what we do about that, that kind of gets down to the, to the management aspect of things. Um, so I'm not going to touch on that a lot. That's not really my area of expertise. Um, but from a parting thought perspective, I think that this type of webinar is a really great venue to, to talk about the issue and, and get folks aware of it. I think the more we can have conversations about contaminants of emerging concern and, and the issues around them and, and what needs to get done is how we engage the public. Um, and it's how we get some of these up to maybe the policy and prevention folks. Um, again, like I said, regulation takes a long time. So Unfortunately, I think, or fortunately, it's on us and it's on uh, society to, to, to take a stand and, and look to try to reduce these, whether it's through reducing in your own use in your household or you know being proactive about talking about it. I think that the only way these are gonna be reduced is taking an active stand on it. Um, and that's kind of been my soapbox of late. But I, I, I like the fact that we were able to bring attention to this. Um, if you have any further thoughts or questions, please reach out, don't hesitate. There's a lot of information that um, I can dump in the chat um, on, on these issues and on, and on what we know. So um, again, thank you everyone for participating. Greg, that, that was inspirational. Do you have a parting message too or anything to add to the climate change? Yeah, on the climate change uh, issue, uh, a couple more examples is as we have more flooding, we have to be mindful of lands that are heavily contaminated, things like brown fields and Superfund sites that might be more at risk for flooding and scouring off those pollutants into surface water. Another element is we know that at any given time, there's what we call a cocktail of contaminants in our surface waters. We don't know how increased temperature and acidity could impact the um, synergistic effects of multiple pollutants at any given time. So great big questions to answer there. It's a really fascinating uh, part of the science uh, of climate change and toxic contaminants. A good question. And to conclude, I'd say this can feel overwhelming really fast, uh, but we have to be mindful of the quality of our living res resources in addition to quantity. It's great to have lots of fish in the bay, but it's not great if those fish have pollutants in them that are toxic to human beings and toxic to other eco-receptors. So we have to keep working on this and appreciate the science community coming together to help us with prioritization, prioritization and management actions for these pollutants. So thanks very much for the opportunity today. So I, I just wanna thank you both. Uh,
Kelly and Greg, that was wonderful. Um, and tell everyone, um, please again, uh, reach out. They've offered their help and uh, join us for our next webinar. Uh, I think the topic's gonna be the Conowingo, which should be really interesting. So um, many thanks and um, have a great month.